Good morning and welcome to our first online worship service. Uh, this is a unique time and uh, I'm glad to have to help us join in worship my kids, Bethany and Micah, to the side here. And uh, we're going to sing some songs together. We're going to look at some scripture. We're going to hear a message. We're going to have an opportunity just to worship together. Even though we're not present together physically, we are present. And we know that where two or more are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, he is there with us. And so we're trusting that he's going to be with us as we worship together. And uh, I want to invite you to, to worship I want to invite you to turn your heart uh, to the Lord and hear Him. Um, this time is a special time because we're gathering together to lift up uh, our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Micah is going to help lead us uh, out in worship with uh, some scripture this morning. All right, so uh, it's out of uh, Psalm 95, starting in verse 1. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. If you'll bow your head and pray with me from home. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we thank you that in times of crisis you are still sovereign. Um, we thank you for your sovereign hand at work throughout this in the hearts of uh, those who are suffering from the disease. And I thank you, God, that even though we can't all be together physically as a church family, we are connected through you um, by, by the Holy Spirit. We're connected to each other as a very large church family, Father, and I, I thank you for that this morning. So I, I pray that this time of worship that we have with everyone would be blessed and that we would still very much feel your presence even though we're far apart. mighty to save. Jesus is mighty to save. We look to him because his mercy is new every morning.
call upon your name, we can praise your goodness, even in times like these, Lord, when we don't know what's going on. God, we know you are good. We will cling to that truth.
Father, even in the midst of all this, when we can't see what's going on, when we don't know how you're working, God, we praise you. It is well with our souls. It is well with my soul. For you are our comfort. You are the truth. You are our stay. You are our foundation, God. Though the virus comes and things close around us, God, you are a firm foundation so we can say it is well with our souls, God. We praise you. We give you the glory in the midst. We thank you, Father. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 God is in control. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we're glad to be able to worship together as a church family. Though we are separate, uh, we are one in the Spirit. One of the things that uh, we do during normal worship services is we take up an offering. We don't have any ushers that can go to your homes and pick up offering this morning. Um, uh, so we're going to try to do the next best thing. And uh, you may have taken advantage of some of our online giving. On our website, we have instructions on how to do that. If you're an online giver and you do that on a regular basis, you can take the opportunity to uh, go ahead and uh, do your online giving while we are uh, doing our offering and while we're singing here this offertory. If uh, your normal practice is like me, I do one of these bank transfers uh, once a month. And so I don't put money in the offering and I don't click a button to, to give online. That's already been done. So during the offering, normally our worship services, what I do is I just pray. And I just uh, focus my attention on the Lord. So this morning, that might be where you're at. While we're taking up our offering, uh, you can pray along. You can enjoy the music and just uh, above all, give praise to God because he alone is worthy of all praise. And so we're going to sing to him.
scripture from uh, Paul the Apostle in his letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 3, and I think it's very appropriate today. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are living in unprecedented historic times. The weight of just how much life has changed in the space of a week is beginning to settle on us. Last week, we met for worship in real space. Today, we are faced with the reality that we don't know exactly how long we're going to meet virtually for worship. Last week, we were just starting to think about what we could and could not do, what we could touch and what we could not touch. Today, we're faced with the reality that we might not be able to go anywhere except online for a period of time. Last week, we were fighting against the changes in our daily lives that were beginning to impact us. Today, we are working through the logistics and the practical application of just how to make those changes. Change is hard for all of us. While we've heard much about changes such as social distancing, vigorous hand washing, virtual meetings, businesses closing, restaurants adapting, finances shrinking, and the list goes on and on. My thoughts this week have focused on what kind of changes we should be making as spiritual people to the crisis that faces us. For the last few months, my series in 1 Corinthians has highlighted the difference between natural people and spiritual people. Now, the Apostle Paul, who brought the gospel of Christ to the people of Corinth, was concerned that they did not understand these differences, and so he wrote his letter to make it plain to them what their life as a believer in Christ, as a spiritual person, should look like. What I've found is that today, those who are Christ followers need to understand this message as well, because it's difficult to make changes. The change from a person who is not in Christ to a person who has trusted Christ as Lord and Savior. Now the first thing that the Corinthians needed to know, and we need to know also, is that a natural person has not trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. The Bible tells us that we are all born spiritually dead. The Bible tells us that our hearts, the innermost part of our being, is against God, resists God, and God's will for them. And until we surrender to Him as Lord and Savior by faith, then this resistance continues. Many people in our corner of the world mistakenly believe that a good person or a church person is the ticket into God's good graces. This is just not true. The Bible makes this clear from the beginning to the end, but I think Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 Say it clearly, short and sweet. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. Now until we get this and get it good, we will continue to operate with the mistaken belief that good people are good to go. What I mean by that is that they are in terms of their relationship with God, their relationship is a righteous one. Their relationship is good. Good people are not good to go with God until they have trusted their life and their future solely and completely to Jesus Christ. If we as God's people are convinced that the people God has placed in our lives need to hear and come to terms with the good news of salvation, then they will not hear it. They will not receive it, and they will not understand it. Paul asks this question of us all in Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 15. He says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now, be careful 
You must not listen to these words of Paul and think that because you're not a preacher that you are not called to tell others the good news. Every believer in Christ is called to tell the good news. Every single one of us who is called in the name of the Lord Jesus is called to tell the good news to those to whom God brings into our life and gives us opportunity. Just think of it this way. Think, show, and tell. We are called to show the love of Christ and to tell the gospel of Christ. Now is the time to start pleading with God to show you who to tell the good news to and to show you how to tell the good news and to put it on your heart to ask God to soften the hearts of those who are resisting God's call in them. Now is the time, not tomorrow, today. Today is the day of salvation. We must understand that just a week ago, a few weeks ago, the Holy Spirit shifted gears on us. We were headed out on the highway, just cruising with the wind in our hair, and the Lord downshifted and said to his people, Giddy up, it's time for us to get going. I told you last week, when I asked the Lord what I should know about our present crisis, he impressed on my heart to watch and to see what he is doing. Well, I've been watching, and I've been looking, and what continues to be pressed on my heart more and more is the Lord is using this time to make a way for hard hearts to be softened and ready for the message of the gospel. I am convinced that God is working in this way in our world. I am also convinced that the Lord has made us ready for what we need to be ready for up to this point. He is still getting us ready for what is to come, but up until this point, His grace has been sufficient for us. And His grace that He gives us each and every day will be sufficient for us for what we need for the tasks in the days to come. The good news is for us today that God's got an endless supply of His grace and His supply lines are never in danger of being cut off. The danger that we face as believers in Christ is that in this time of crisis, rather, rather than responding as the people of God that we are, that we will respond as the natural people that we used to be. The danger is that even though God has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, that we haven't yet been transformed in our inner being. The danger is that when the world really needs people who are born of the Spirit of God, we will sink back into acting like people of the flesh. But I have higher hopes for us. I have seen, even in the midst of chaos, great evidence that God's people are looking to Him, that they are trusting in Him, that their hope is placed firmly in Him, that their days are ordered by Him. This morning I want to bring a word to you from the book of Acts, chapter 11, verses 27 through 30. It's just a short passage. I want to invite you to grab your Bibles and read along with me. This small passage highlights the response of God's people to a global crisis. As we see, these spiritual people responded by the Spirit of God by prioritizing their help to those who needed it most. This lesson is, that, is one that we need to emphasize in our time of global crisis. When crisis hits, Spiritual people respond out of concern for those in need. Acts chapter 11, let me read verses 27 through 30. Now in those days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine all over the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. There are a couple of points that I want to pull out of this short section of Scripture. The first one is that the world suffers through periods of global crisis. The Lord made the world to be perfect, but due to the reality of sin, 
The truth is that this world is destined to wear out and eventually one day to be destroyed. The Lord made it perfectly clear to his disciples not only that this world would be a place of trouble, but also that they would go through that trouble because they live in the world. He said this from John 16, 33. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Notice that the Lord didn't just promise your run-of-the-mill kinds of trouble, the annoyances and frustrations of the day, today living on planet Earth. Instead, he promised tribulation, which is the worst kind of trouble, the kind of trouble which pushes human beings past their limits and into the point of desperation. But at the same time, you see that he wanted to encourage his disciples to keep things in their proper perspective. You see, he had overcome the world. He had mastery and victory over the sin which engulfs the world. His perfect obedience to his Father in heaven was to provide for the redemption of this world. In this life, we are promised difficulties, but the fact that Jesus has overcome the world means that he will bring us through those difficulties. He won't necessarily deliver us from every difficulty, but he will bring us through both in this life and into his eternal kingdom where we are promised that no trouble of any kind is allowed to enter. To put a fine point on it, God's people are not exempt from the troubles that touch this world. In the time of the early church, the trouble they faced was a famine that engulfed the entire uh, world that, as they knew it. We know from history that in 45 AD, the, then uh, Claudius, who was emperor of Rome, it's recorded that there was a great famine. The followers of Jesus, both in Antioch and in the land of Israel, were not spared from this trouble. Instead, they had to go through it along with everybody else. Now here we see that God works in extraordinary and special ways through his people to be prepared to respond in times of crisis. At that time, there were some prophets that came up to the church in Antioch from the church in Jerusalem. Antioch was unique at this time in Christian history because when that church was started, it just didn't have just people of Jewish origin or descent. There were those who had no connection to the people of Israel who heard the message of Christ and placed their faith and their hope in Him. They were the beginning of the fulfillment of Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus said that his disciples would be witnesses for him in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Antioch, in one sense, symbolized the beginning of the gospel going to the ends of the earth. The prophets from Jerusalem would have gone to this relatively new church to encourage them in the Lord. Now, a prophet is a person who speaks messages from God. Most of the time when people think of prophecy, they think of it as uh, foretelling the future. But the other aspect of prophecy, which is actually more common, is to tell what God wants people to know in the present. So these two aspects of prophecy are simply called either foretelling or forthtelling. Most of the time, prophecy is foretelling for the purpose of of encouraging God's people, but sometimes it is also for the purpose of preparing God's people or warning them of what's to come. Now this is what happened in Antioch. Agabus the prophet gave his message, and the purpose of this message to the church was so that they could respond to the, mix my pages up here, To the coming crisis according to God's agenda. The purpose of Agabus's prophecy was so that the people of Antioch could respond to the coming crisis according to God's agenda. It seems 
like Christians today, respond to reports of coming crisis in general by hoarding items that they need. As we've seen this last week, this is the response of the world, and uh, sometimes Christians get caught into this same kind of response. I, I would put money on it that more toilet paper has been snatched up in this last week than in the entire history of the world. Believers are not exempt from responding to crises by looking to themselves first and foremost. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to be prepared. What I am saying is that hoarding is not the example that was set by the, these believers in Antioch. And they have a message for us today. Their message simply is that spiritual people respond to crisis by sending relief to those who are in need. Now, upon hearing this prophecy, the first thing that these believers in Antioch did was to think about their brothers and sisters in Christ in Jerusalem and in the surrounding area of Judea. Rather than stockpiling goods that they knew they would need because of the famine, they determined to give away a portion of it so that their brothers and sisters would be provided for. Now, this is truly the heart of the Lord Jesus. When the heart of the Lord replaces our original hard and selfish heart, this is the kind of thing that happens. I'm not saying that only God's people are going to be concerned about people in need, but I am saying this, that if God's people aren't concerned about others who are in need, then something is drastically wrong. Notice that these disciples gave according to their ability to give. They all didn't give the same amount, but they were all united in the fact that everyone needed to give. This is an important point for us to not gloss over too quickly. There is a reason why everyone gave, and that reason is that everyone was concerned about their brothers and sisters in the Lord who were in need. Let these spiritual people from history inspire us today to become united in our concern for those in need, even as we are diverse in how we respond to them. One of the most interesting parts of this passage is the word relief. Verse 28 says the disciples determined to send relief to the brothers in Judea. That word relief is actually three words in the original Greek language. And one of those three words is the same word that we use for deacon. So get this. The relief that they sent was meant to serve their brothers and sisters. That's what the word deacon means. It means to serve. And so they sent relief to be of service, to help those who were in time of need. This makes me think about the reason that the deacons were created in the first place. In the church of Jerusalem, there were widows who were in need of food who were not being provided for. These were the women who were the most vulnerable in their society. They didn't have others to provide for them. And some of them in the church were not being provided for. Their need was being overlooked. And the deacons were appointed so that all of them, regardless of whether they were Jewish in background or Gentile, would have the food and the resources that they needed. The heart of the deacon is to serve, and it is an extension of God's heart, which is to provide for people, especially those who have the greatest need among us. Isn't this, is this not the reason why we are keeping our social distance from one another? In our time of crisis, as God's people, we must be concerned for those who are the most vulnerable among us, those who are most uh, vulnerable in terms of their health. We don't want to, if we can help it in any way, pass this virus along to someone who might pass it along to someone else who has a compromised immune system or who is in the vulnerable category. We do this as believers out of the concern and care which comes from Jesus Christ who has instructed us to love our neighbors as ourselves. We are concerned in this time for those 
who will be especially lonely and without contact. God made us to not be alone. He made us to have fellowship with each other. And so the church, our church, has responded by starting a calling tree, a calling tree, the old-fashioned phone call way. And that is where we will call each other and check in to make sure that we are doing well. We are also making plans to continue our small groups, our Bible studies, our Wednesday night ministries, and our grow groups on Sabbath morning in the video conference format. Earlier this morning, our grow group met in video conference. In addition, I will be doing a daily video chat at 3 o'clock in the afternoon each day during the duration of this crisis for anyone that wants to just see some friendly faces and to talk, to ask questions, to fellowship with one another. It's an all call, so if you want to be a part of it, you want to check in on any given day, check your email or the church's Facebook page for more information on how you can do that because I will be sharing that with you all. We have an opportunity before us to respond to this, our crisis, and to respond as spiritual people should respond. Allow these believers in Antioch to move you to follow their example. Let me encourage you in this by joining with me in the prayer that the Lord placed on my heart three weeks ago, and this is the prayer that I've been praying daily ever since. Lord, show me your agenda and change my agenda so that it lines up with yours. The Lord has an agenda for this world. I want to be a part of this agenda, and I hope that you do too. God's grace is available to us today. My prayer is that his grace would extend to us so that we can especially be concerned and care for others, and we can especially see what he's doing and join in with him. To that end, I want to invite you to pray with me. Our Father, I give you the praise because you have seen this crisis coming, and Lord, you have prepared your people to respond. We may not feel like we're prepared. We may not feel like we're prepared for all the changes that have been thrust upon us. But Lord, even now, I believe that you're pouring out your grace upon us. We thank you for that. We thank you for the fellowship of the believers in Christ. And we pray that in this time where it seems so difficult, Lord, that you would even strengthen our bonds together. Father, that you would strengthen our resolve in you, that you would strengthen our faith in you. Lord, that you would rise up the passion that we have to be those who are obedient and who are following in your footsteps, who are keeping in step with the Spirit. Lord, lead us to those who are asking spiritual questions, whose hearts are open. Lord, let us be sensitive. Let us be prepared to help those in need. And Father, for all of these things, we know that you can do exceedingly abundantly beyond anything we could ever ask or imagine. To you be the glory, Lord. We praise you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And amen. I want to thank you uh, that you chose to join us this morning for worship. We're going to continue to uh, worship virtually as long as we need to. And so just plan on worshiping with your church family. If you have the opportunity to invite anyone to join in and to be a part of it, I want to encourage you to take that step. Before I let you go, I want to make a few announcements here. Of course, with the, many of the changes that have arisen uh, from this epidemic, our church activities have either been postponed or canceled or moved online, and uh, I want to encourage you to make notes, especially of uh, what changes have been made. To that end, I want to announce just a few things. Our Devon Oasis Diaper Drive, we are continuing to uh, gather items as we, um, as we can, not right now, of course, but when we're able to come together we can uh, finish the diaper drive and then we will send it down to our partners in ministry 
Devon Oasis. So if you still have some diapers to bring in, don't worry. Uh, we're not going to bring them down until uh, this uh, crisis has uh, passed. Next, we are going to continue to do our pie and praise, but we are moving it online. Sabbath, April 4th at 4 p.m. is when it's scheduled for. We will keep that time. We will invite you to join online, and we're going to give you some information on that, so stay tuned, either on uh, Facebook or on our email network, and we'll uh, show you how exactly we're going to do that. But I want to encourage you, if you have pies to make, or if you have desserts or anything, um, make that and we can enjoy dessert together. The reason why we're doing this is because we want to share together in fellowship our Yes God, our encouraging story that brings God glory, so that we can have our hearts prepared for the celebration of Easter, the Lord's resurrection. Keep uh, your eye on um, our, our um, announcements um, by email and by Facebook because it appears right now that um, uh, we may need to continue to cancel services during our Easter weekend, but we just don't know, uh, so I invite you to stay tuned. In regards to the capital campaign, if you feel uh, led to continue to uh, give and to um, uh, support the capital campaign, if you're able to do that even in this um, time of financial con uh, um, uh, changes, there are still a few uh, wall um, envelopes on the money wall. So if you have questions about that, um, uh, just uh, give Janet in the church office a call and she'll let you know what, uh, what envelopes are still available for March. And uh, finally, uh, we will resume our Operation Christmas Style uh, collection when we next gather again for church. So uh, um, we are, are uh, not going to collect anything until the um, time when we can gather again. With that, let me uh, just close our time together by um, uh, praying that God's grace and his peace would rest upon you today, that you would be filled with the Spirit, that you would live in joy, and that you would live in peace, and that you would cast your cares and your anxieties on him who cares for you. Uh, go in God's grace. Remember, God loves you, and I love you too. Have a great rest of your Sabbath day. Thank you.